As our world races at an ever faster pace. We'll land an airplane every 70 seconds for more than two hours. And delivery deadlines shrink. Being an island, there's a lot of medicine coming in. It's always urgent. The skies aren't necessarily the limit for the mega movers. Almost everything in this world you can put in this aircraft. In this series, we go deep inside the $6 trillion air freight industry. Every day, we move the equivalent of 3% of the world's GDP. You name it, we can move it. Showing the people. You have a lot of high anxiety, you don't want to do this. They're just sitting on the runway laughing at me. And incredible operations. This is a little bit sticky. Whoa, 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 whoa. We have an aircraft on stand 666, which has got an engine for it. We get two minutes to get there. To keep this complex, high-pressure trade airborne. There's 30 tonne of weight on that aircraft. It could tip the aircraft up at worst, or it could damage the fuselage. And travel with an extraordinary array of goods. Now we just need the spacecraft so we can load and then get out of Dodge. From out of this world giants, life-saving medical supplies. It's a very good feeling knowing that every day we are shipping medication that could improve someone's life. Perishables. Nobody is, is in such a hurry as a dead salmon. And components for some of the greatest spectacles on Earth. 21 races, if it took three weeks to get it there by sea, we need a 63-week year. Uh, we have to use that. Put your seats in the upright position, buckle in, and prepare to go max speed with Mega Air. In this episode... All right, have you done your lasers up? Are you ready to go? All right. Mega Air goes Mega Air less. But definitely neat realizing it that that'll get in the air with as much cargo as we're about to load on it. Yes, we blast through the final frontier, following a satellite into space. Not anybody can say that they work on things that go to space every day. Britain's busiest nighttime cargo airport. We always come up with little issues that always bite you on the... Uh... Battles to upgrade facilities for winter. It's been decided that we're going to go out and anti-ice. It's no good having an airport if you can't land your planes. And one of the world's biggest package delivery services. Tires are good. Last thing we want to do is lose a tire on the takeoff. Goes to extreme lengths to guard urgent next day deliveries. Aviation has long periods of boredom followed by short periods of sheer terror. Sunnyvale, California, in Silicon Valley the heartbeat of the new tech revolution and base for aerospace giant Lockheed Martin. Since I was a little kid, I've always wanted to work uh, in space, uh, with space. Uh, it's really exciting. In this astounding 57,000 square foot high bay facility, their space boffins build cutting edge satellites worth over $100 million. So you'll excuse them from being a mite OCD over cleanliness. Right now, as we go into the high bay, it's a 100K clean room. Uh, and what you'll actually see is a uh, we're going to garment up, and we're going to get cleaned up to make sure we don't bring any foreign object debris into the high bay itself. So uh, first thing we do is we clean off our shoes to make sure that any of the debris from our feet comes off. We'll garment up. We'll put these on. And then last step is uh, we'll actually put on some booties to cover up our feet. It's beautiful. Do I look good? Yes, very fetching. But the prize at the end of all this sartorial trouble makes it totally worth it. Every single day, I wake up thinking, today I get to go and be in the same room as these spacecraft. They're going to go into orbit. So this is the 100K clean room high bay. Very simply, we call it a high bay because uh, the ceilings are extremely high. We essentially get a bunch of different components and kind of the building blocks of the spacecraft delivered here. We bring them all into the high bay, we assemble all of it, and we put it through its rigorous tests. And where we are right now is really at the tail end of that integration and test phase. So we've got one satellite that's uh, getting its final appendages put on, and it'll be ready to go. 
and we've got this satellite, uh, which is already in its transportation container, uh, ready to be shipped tomorrow. Inside this appropriately spacey looking shipping container is a Hellas Sat 4 Saudi Geosat 1, or a commercial satellite to you and me. It's the largest, most powerful spacecraft Lockheed has ever built and will service the Middle East and Europe. And so what we're doing now is finally uh, finishing the last preparations. We're buttoning it up. And then uh, later today, we're going to bring a truck in here to take it out. And tomorrow, we'll load it into the Antonov and ship it to French Guiana. French Guiana in South America is the satellite launch site. Run by the European Space Agency, it ranks among the most modern space facilities in the world. With over 220 rocket launches to its name. But to get there, it must leave the protective high bay area and face the perils of the dirty and dangerous big outdoors. We pride ourselves on our mission success. There's no room for error. Uh, the satellite business uh, is one where you can't go fix it once it's on orbit. And so uh, we take that level of rigor and diligence into the container itself, creating the 3D models to make sure everything would fit correctly, because if it's transporting our, our spacecraft, it needs to be done right. To ensure no mishap befalls our satellite flying to the launch site and space beyond, it's put through its paces in a kind of galactic boot camp. The satellite that's uh, being transported is going to be uh, over 6,000 kilograms. So it's going to be very heavy and give it a pretty rough ride. So we do all of our testing to make sure the spacecraft itself is structurally sound. Behind this uh, big red door is where we uh, simulate the vibration environment that it'll experience when it's on the rocket on its way to space. You can hear uh, a lot of echo in here. It's uh, specifically designed uh, for that purpose. Uh, so the large holes you see up there are our uh, acoustic horns. Basically, the acoustic sound pressure will be coming down to the spacecraft and then uh, reverberating around, creating the exact profile of acoustic pressure that we're looking for. Make sure it holds together when it's on the rocket. If AI would have had any significant uh, failures in these tests, uh, we would not be shipping the spacecraft tomorrow. I mean, these things are going into space. Uh, it's not every day where anybody here, even in Silicon Valley, can say that they work on things that go to space every day. Well, there you have it. This six and a half ton satellite has been built to eye-watering expense and tested to within an inch of its life. So the transport team better not put a foot wrong. OK, I think we're ready. Or else the only rocket taking place may be up their backside. In certain directions, it's very robust. In other directions, it's not so. It's, it's, it's fragile. Louisville, USA, home to UPS, a giant of global package delivery. Their mega shipment machine whirring to the roar of over 500 planes, air freighting to 220 countries. Hello, Dan. Ready for a hot launch? Yeah, I am. With the bulk of volume, time critical next day air, any major disruption can cause service meltdown. Let's go. So when all else fails, the brave men that fly to the rescue are the hot spares. The hot spare program recovers about a million packages a year. So there's packages somewhere that need some help getting to their destination. The reason why we're here is to ensure that the packages will not be late. They make an unlikely pair of guardian angels, but Rob and First Officer Dan must scramble to replace any canceled flights from things like mechanical failure or sickness and ensure that packages are delivered on time. It's the captain's job to do a full walk around. When on call, their first task is to check their MD-11 aircraft. We're going to make sure overall integrity of the airplane is uh, in good airworthy shape. We're going to start off with the tires. Just look at general condition of the tire. Make sure the tread is all uh, appropriate. Tires are good. All the bolts are in place. That all looks good. They're all there. Nice integrity. Uh, if one of those is loose, as we're rolling down the runway, the tire would be out of balance. 
And that's the last thing we want to do is lose a tire on the takeoff. We want to make sure that all these brake lines are intact. There's no uh, fluid dripping on the ground. We look in here. We look to see if there's any fluid on the ground. The outside of the engine overall looks good. Then we'll look inside. Looking at the uh, nacelle, making sure there's no dents on the nacelle. Looking at all the fan blades. Everything's intact. There's no obvious dents or nicks. All looks good. Their schedule-saving weapon of choice today is a McDonnell Douglas MD-11, a tireless, long-distance, wide-bodied workhorse of UPS's fleet. OK, engine fire test. As Captain Rob prowls his aircraft outside, Overspeed. inside, First Officer Dan is checking the aircraft's myriad electronic systems. The MD-11 has a lot of automatic features, so I just really check a lot of the automatic systems are doing their, their intended function. Stabilizer. Because when we get airborne, uh, we, it's, it's hard for us to go ahead and correct anything if, if anything breaks. God forbid. And a great motivator for Captain Rob to leave no stone unturned. Looking at the leading edge, this is a very common area to get bird strikes, so making sure there's no remains of birds, making sure there's no dents, no cracks, and overall uh, integrity of the leading edge. I probably experience a bird strike once a month or so, and it can be very loud in the airplane if it hits the nose area. It sounds like anti-aircraft fire sometimes when it hits really hard, and it really wakes you up. But they usually get out of the way because we always win if it's a competition between us and a bird. Once they've scrupulously examined their big metal bird, they do it all over again with a written checklist. Off. Seatbelts. Off. Emergency power. Off. We'll spare you those exhaustive details. Radar. Off. Once done, the MD-11 is given the seal of approval. All right, the pre-flight's been complete. I'm going to put a seal on the door, and this indicates the aircraft is in the exact same position that I left it. So we can open the door, break the seal, do a few pre-flight checks, and get pushed back in relatively quickly. Then it's off to the pilot's mess hall to play the waiting game. The aircraft's ready for a hot launch. We basically sit and wait. I'm basically going to sit here and read for a little while. So it's just finding something to do and occupy ourselves until you get the call. So as Captain Rob indulges in a little light reading, the third edition avionics systems manual Dan's having a good time. He's not going to read any manuals or anything like that. First Officer Dan gives a privileged peek at the pilot's inner sanctum. All right. Yeah, we're uh, walking through the, uh, the halls towards the sleep room. It's kind of a, a rat maze. I think it's over this way. Here you go. So here's what a typical sleep room looks like. It's uh, just big enough for a, for a single bed. Each of the sleep rooms have a, has a telephone. In case they uh, can't get a hold of us on our beeper or our cell phone, they'll call this phone right here in case we have to launch. But sadly for Dan, 40 Winks is denied. With the MD-11 hot crew, please report to the jump seat desk. As we'll see, a hot launch sends him and Captain Rob scurrying to rescue stranded packages. Aviation has long periods of boredom, followed by short periods of sheer terror. In the UK, East Midlands Airport is gearing up for winter. The country's premier pure cargo hub is acutely aware even a hostile act from the weather gods must be mitigated to keep their multi-billion pound business from hitting the skids. We push through about 380,000 tonnes of cargo every year. And what really makes us different is we're a 24-hour operation. And what's incredibly important to us is that we stay open all the time. Well, How are you? Are you good? <laughs> On a chilly November evening, Ground Ops Chief Steve Irwin, a.k.a. Croc, will be marshalling a major runway overhaul. Tonight's works, some parts of the airfield are tired, and then he'd upgraded it, and we're installing a nice prediction system on the runway. So this system will uh, allow us to work out the best time for putting de-icing down. So a bit like what you spray on your windscreen, we'll be spraying that across the runway. Now, you've got to think this stuff's about a pound a litre. Now, every time we spray it, it costs us 12,000 pounds. At the height of the winter last year, we might have been putting 64,000 pounds worth of de-icer down on the runway. So if we can predict that a lot better, a lot to do. 
So we better get going. <laughs> yep, time will not be Croc's friend tonight. As the last aircraft jets off at midnight, the runway shuts and his troops roll in with just four hours to complete a mountain of work. The clock has started. It's not just done on, oh, I think we'll turn up tonight and dig a hole and stick a bit of tarmac in the ground. It doesn't happen at airports. So we've got road sweepers, drilling crews, traffic management, all the excavators, diggers, lighting. You've just got to plan as much as you can and uh, make sure that if anything does go wrong that you've got the backup procedure in place to, uh, I'll say it, pull you out the Well, right from the off, poor old Croc heads up that certain creek without a paddle. Yeah, it's going to be a no-go. Far too wet. First job, the repaint of the centre runway lines has been rained off. No painting's going to happen now tonight. It's just far too wet. At the minute, we've just got to uh, bite the bullet and, uh, and say that we can't do it. Are you happy? <laughs> <laughs> After that opening damp squib, Croc's runway repair takes a further nosedive. We've uh, sort of called the lighting pot that the light fitting uh, sits in. On the centre line of the runway, I've uh, just asked me to come up and have a look at um, an issue they might have. It looks like we found another old fitting underneath it. So um, we'll just fill this light in tonight and then we may have to have an emergency closure tomorrow night to put this pot back in again. On top of that, the runway spouts a fountain of water. But this is good news. So we're basically checking all the fire hydrants to make sure everything's OK. Everything looks good on here. They'll just move down now and continue the same thing on the next, uh, the next one down the line. The main winterproofing job tonight is the ice prediction stations that promise to cut the airport's astronomical de-icing bills. So time-wise now, we're just coming up to three o'clock, so every minute counts. If that's not on track, there's one surefire prediction. Croc will be firmly in a croc of deep doo-doo. What's guaranteed here is that there'll be aeroplanes in that sky and uh, it'll be on our head in the morning if they can't land here. I might have to go and pick my P-45 up. In Silicon Valley, California, the countdown has begun to move the satellite worth over $100 million. We've got this satellite, which is already in its transportation container. It must leave its protective cocoon of the High Bay warehouse and venture out into the big bad world. So right now, we're actually just finishing up, uh, buttoning up the container. We'll actually put it onto a flatbed truck. We have our different gases here. We'll keep the gases basically uh, pumping, and uh, we'll essentially keep the pressure of the container inside the spacecraft at a positive pressure and uh, ensure that none of the external air, as soon as we open the door and go outside, uh, gets inside the spacecraft. We'll also have a, uh, a generator kind of keeping everything going and we have uh, remote monitoring, uh, allowing us to, in real time, see the temperature, humidity of the spacecraft at all times. The man who has to bear the galactic responsibility of safely moving this six and a half ton satellite, bristling with fragile parts, is Robert Knopf. Okay, I think we're ready. All righty, guys, you ready for a pre-task briefing? This is our pre-task briefing for the convoy out to the to Moffett Field, followed by the onload of the container. Our first task is gonna be get the generator fired up, get the ECU turned on. Pretty much at that point, we're gonna be ready to roll. We're getting ready to turn the system on. Okay, so we wanna open up all six K bottles? All six. All six. It creates a dry atmosphere inside the container. We induce uh, dry air to help keep it dry. Crank it up to about 30 PSI. Okay, we're good. Everything looks like it's in good shape. We're gonna hit the road. With all the satellite's vital signs forensically monitored, the convoy will travel less than a mile to the federal airfield, Moffat. There, it will meet the winged colossus with a convoluted name. 
the Antonov 124-100-150. Earlier, it thundered into Moffat, much to the obvious pride of sales director Amnon Ehrlich. So if we look, and you'll notice the beautiful blue and yellow colors of our Ukrainian flag. Right now we're looking at the aircraft in the kneeled position. The front of the plane lowers down, the wheels go out, and there's supports that'll hold up the, the weight of the aircraft. We kneel the aircraft so that we have a better angle for the cargo to get loaded in. Let's take a walk inside. It is much easier to climb the stairs now since the aircraft is kneeled down. Uh, maybe not. We have uh, 38 meters long of cargo space, a 4.4 meters high for us to load, and six meters wide. And it is a single deck aircraft, unlike most uh, Let's call them Western-based aircraft, like a 747, that's, that's two-deck aircraft. If you look above, you can see the tracks for our internal crane system. One of the things that's amazing about this aircraft is the ramp system, the way that it operates, and the cranes. Uh, this differentiates us from just about every other type of aircraft. With these cranes, we can lift up to 30 tons that we can lift and load. So the guys are putting together the ramp system now that's gonna come out a significant distance. And once the ramp system is built, there'll be an external crane that will lift uh, the spacecraft and put it onto the ramp system, which will then winch it into the aircraft. The Antonov crew live and work on this aviation monster for up to six weeks, trekking the world. But now they must pull out their A-game as they'll be breaking new territory. Being that this is our first flight with Lockheed, it is rather important that it is successful. There's always challenges uh, in a project like this. For one, schedule is really important to Lockheed. They have to make sure that this spacecraft makes it to the launch facility on time. We've been working well over a year to get to this point, and here we are. The day's come. So, as we'll discover, the stakes are not even sky high, they're space high. So that will be on top of that. We're gonna move to ramp pressure further, as Moffat is a federal airfield, the place shuts before midnight. This is the first time I'm using the new, newly designed container, so I think we're a little bit behind schedule. <laughs> In the dead of night at East Midlands Airport, Ground Ops Chief Croc is feeling the strain. We always come up with little issues that always bite you on the... Uh, on the he must get a small army of contractors to complete a major upgrade to the runway before the Dawn Air Cargo operation roars into life. Six minutes past four, so... Everybody's starting to come off now. We're going to do the, the final clean-up of the area now. And then at 5 o'clock, we do all the security checks. Come on, then. We ain't got all night. Still toiling away is the crew installing ice prediction sensors. With winter imminent, these should accurately forecast when and how much de-icer to spray on the runway saving the airport a small fortune in de-icing bills and disrupted cargo flights. We've got quite a tight working window. So the procedure, what's going on over here now, is essentially cutting the runway, and we've got a resin bond, uh, the, the sensor, into the runway itself. Hopefully get everything uh, in before we need to have the runway open again. If the runway is, uh, has got snow and ice on it, they're gonna have difficulty landing, um, particularly here, because there's a lot of cargo that comes in. Yeah. Well, that's it, it's just like a composite block. Okay, it's reading a uh, surface temperature here, and there's another one down here that gives you a, a, a ground temperature reading. And then we've got some conductivity stuff here and here, which is basically what tells us um, if we've got ice forming on the runway. They've cut it all out, cleaned it all out, dried it all out as best they can. Cables have been installed in. Now they're, now they're basically uh, trying to get the level right for the... Uh, the surface sensor in the runway here. And then once they've got all the cables and everything through, everyone's happy with what they've done, that's when they'll mix up the resin and we'll get it all, um, all bonded in. 
I hope you've measured this right. Uh, and then it's on a cable, which essentially comes all the way through the ground here. It all goes into the weather station, which is going to be situated up there. And that will all help them make decisions on whether to, well, de-ice their runway or not, and hopefully keep everything running. In the end, the runway overhaul goes right to the wire. So you can already hear out there, we've got planes taking off. So we were just in time to hand back without disrupting uh, aircraft movements. We didn't have any planes, we wouldn't have any freight, and then, obviously, we, we wouldn't have a job. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>The next day. So I think we're probably about 15, 20 minutes away from uh, the big power up. The runway sensors are being hooked up to the weather station. The big switch on. The big switch on. <laughs> and hovering ominously nearby is Croc with a big stick. This is the GPS. So what we're doing with the GPS is actually recording the position of the weather stations, where all the cabling goes. We use this bit of kit along with the, the receiver on the top. So it's a bit like the GPS in your car, but just very, very accurate. If you've got machineries or people digging around live cables, we want to know exactly where they are. The only snag to pinpoint the sensors on the runway, Crop must find his own slot among the aircraft. We've only literally got five minutes in between flights, so once this one lands, I'll keep an eye on that aircraft out there. I'll quickly run out into the restricted zone, take the shots on this uh, base, but literally I've, I've only got minutes to do these now in between flights. That's how tight things are. All right, have you done your laces up? Are you ready to go? So hopefully now we'll taxi off at Mike and we'll uh, get in. All right. It's go, go, go. Croc must play a nerve-jangling run the gauntlet with 100-plus tonne aircraft speeding at over 100 miles per hour. So I've got to keep a listen out on the radio in case anything changes. But we have five minutes. So I'm just going to take a quick... Uh, at the far end is where the, um, the actual ice, ice prediction sensor is, ice detection sensor is. So I'm just going to quickly... Um, so, uh, no time for fumbles now, Croc. Um, record the position on the end of the runway of this. All right, and then we're actually going to go out onto the runway. And this is the actual position of the actual sensor. That's it. That's all we're going to get. We've done our job. Still thankfully in one piece, Croc is able to witness the historic booting up of the new weather station. I don't anger the weather station gods, but I think we're good. It's, a, as you can see, a bottom of the range uh, Dell rugged laptop. That's not very rugged, it's just really heavy. And uh, at the moment, we're just trying to connect to the station via the wireless LAN, which we can do here, just to see the data to make sure all the sensors we've wired in are working. So this is where the fingers are crossed, and we're hoping to see lots of numbers and no slashes. OK, that's good. See, we have uh, the wind sensors working now, as you can see. We've got uh, runway sensor reading. This looks good so far, so fingers crossed we'll be OK. But as they say, the proof is in the pudding. And whether or not that pudding will have icing all over it. Later, winter strikes as the mercury plummets Will all the trouble and effort pay dividends? We need to make sure that the whole site is ready for this cold snap tonight. In Louisville, USA, hot spares duo Captain Rob and First Officer Dan are like tightly coiled springs. The aircraft's ready for a hot launch. We basically sit and wait. Poised to fly and replace any cancelled UPS flight to rescue their package delivery. The interesting thing about the hot spare is you could go just about any place. So I generally pack for about a week at a time. Uh, sometimes we go to a place where it's cold, really cold. We'll go up to Anchorage in the middle of the winter, and then we'll continue on to uh, Asia. 
where it happens to be really, really hot. You never know where you're going to wind up, so it is incredibly dynamic. While flight crew wait for any hot launch, they're royally looked after, with a comfortable lounge, dormitories, and a dark chill room. And of course, the staple for whiling away time, the TV room. By the time I've never turned this TV on. Dan's the man who can unravel frighteningly complex aircraft systems. Maybe it's for the other TV. Can you turn the TV off? Not as it appears, a simple TV. I have no idea whether or not they're gonna go ahead and call us, so I could sit here for the next eight hours in case we get the call. Right now, it's uh, you know the, the calm before the storm, and from midnight to 4 a.m., this place is uh, is pretty busy. It's, uh, it's Grand Central Station, New York City equivalent here at uh, about midnight. As the hours tick by at Worldport, Rob and Dan stay on alert until... Attention crew members, with the MD-11 hot crew, please report to the jump seat desk. The MD-11 hot crew, please report to the jump seat desk. All right, that's us. We go. All right, looks like we've been called out. Let's go find Dan. Marcus, we'll see you later. We have 45 minutes from the minute that we are notified that we're going to be on a hot launch to the minute where we actually push back. You ready? All right, let's go. Okay. Aviation has long periods of boredom followed by short periods of sheer terror start to get your game face on. Uh, there's still a lot of things we don't necessarily know exactly where our destination is, but we know we have an aircraft that's already pre-flighted. You know, a little bit of pressure, but we want to get the aircraft out on time to uh, go rescue our cargo. We still have some last minute work to do. We have to program the FMS with our flight plan. We have to get the current weather, get our current clearance. So there's a lot of things that happen in the very last few minutes of the flight. Just a little bit of adrenaline going, but as soon as we take off, get up to altitude, can relax a little bit and uh, worry about our destination on our landing. All right, clear to push, and uh, we'll get on our way. Okay. Let's get the bird in the air. And just like that, our delivery Batman and Robin, Dan and Rob, are on their way to rescue yet another batch of packages in distress. In Sunnyvale, California, it's all systems go. The giant six and a half ton satellite is painstakingly crawling the one mile journey to Moffett Federal Airfield and the waiting giant transporter, the Antonov. Well, obviously, you know, we have sensitive equipment inside, you know, it's a satellite. In certain directions, it's very robust. In other directions, it's not so. It's, it's, it's fragile. Uh, we take slow speeds, uh, you know, generally just for speed bumps, potholes, that sort of thing. We generally keep around five miles an hour as a max. At the airfield, Antonov director Amnon has brought forward the flight departure before air traffic controllers depart. So they're up against it. So right now, we're just waiting on the satellite to arrive. The only problem with we have a uh, deadline for when we can leave tonight. Air traffic control shuts down at 11, and we have to be out of here before then. So there is a little bit of a, a hurry for us to get out, and, and we're waiting. Now we just need the spacecraft so we can load and then get out of Dodge. Finally, at 6 o'clock, just five hours before cutoff departure time, the satellite rumbles in. A few more minutes, and we should be ready to start lifting. But no sooner do the aircraft crew clap eyes on its monstrous bulk than it sparks a furious Ukrainian debate. Yeah, yeah it's on the back of the trailer. So that will be on top of that. We're going to move on top of that. Obviously, we have uh, the Ukrainian crew. There's a language barrier. Um, that's kind of entertaining sometimes. Uh, but this, we seem to be communicating OK. They, 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 they make their point um, one way or the other. Yeah, this is the same thing. Hopefully, American traffic manager Paige Cummins is on the same page. So right now, uh, the aircraft is just getting prepared to, with the sled system to receive the container. Once the container is loaded onto the sled system, they'll go ahead and slide it into the aircraft so we can go ahead and depart on our way to Houston and then on to French Guiana. This container specifically, there's no other aircraft that can actually receive this container and do a full-on transport. 
it's definitely neat seeing something that large and realizing it that that'll get in the air with as much cargo as we're about to load on it. First stage of the load is crane the satellite container off the truck and onto the Antonov's ramp skids, the pulley system to winch it on board. The key to this is getting the lift center of gravity, or CG, perfect, so the satellite doesn't career wildly out of control. You guys loaded this before? Not this one. Not this one. We are pretty much ready to get the sling uh, you know, brought overhead here and get it rigged up. Then we're going to try to set the CG where we think it is. Don't let it bang into the trailer. Uh, we're taking the ductwork off and getting it ready for the lift. Before the lift can even begin, the CG is still TBC. Hey, Richard. Yes. That is going to be heavy because everything's hanging off that end. I do want that end short. I'm saying this is the heavy end. Okay. I'm just... Okay. It sure is a weighty concern. But right off the bat, the CG sweet spot is hit and the six and a half ton satellite safely swings onto the Antonov's loading ramp. The rest should be a clear home run, in theory. I know we can put a little bit of a snag, uh, unbeknownst to us. You know, the container sits on all this wood dunnage here. We didn't realize the standoffs, which are used for the caster wheels, they extend down further than the support structure. So we can't have this solely sitting on the dunnage, so they need to be removed. We want full contact along the length of the container. I think we're a little bit behind schedule. <laughs> but yes, it, I, it took some time. This is the first time I believe that they're using the new, newly designed container, so it'll be all right. Eventually, the stanchions are removed and the satellite's weight is evenly spread over the ramp. But it's 9 o'clock, and the 11 p.m. departure deadline is in real danger of being missed. Pretty much at this point, I mean, we have some things to do the container itself to prep it for flight. But as far as winching it in, tying it down, that's all on the Antonov crew. The big weights have been lifted off my shoulders, literally. At this point, now that the straps are off, our crew will come down and they're going to start chaining from the container to the, the dollies, and once it's secured, then they're going to start to winch it and pull it inside the aircraft. Pressure is getting it to this point. Once it, it's at this point, it's a lot easier. Rather like an outlandish aviation python, the Antonov stretches credibility as it swallows its huge meal. I literally don't think we have an inch to grow on this container. <laughs> Very tight. Our clearance is only one inch on the sides and the top, and only two inches on the bottom. But it goes in very, very tight. Eventually, at a quarter to midnight, the satellite is stowed. Air traffic control is sweet-talked into staying late. And the giant Antonov is given clearance to begin its 5,000-mile journey to French Guiana in South America. Glad to be on our way at last. Bedtime, I know that much. Been up for about almost 19 hours, time for bed. It's only a quick 40 winks, though. Just five hours later, the satellite is back on terra firma at Houston, Texas. But it's not a case of, Houston, we have a problem. The thirsty Antonov needs a top-up in fuel. The spacecraft did wonderful during the flight. We had no anomalies. It feels wonderful to be basically halfway there. Yep. Soon, it'll be the big launch. After three years in the making, will the satellite touch the stars? January at East Midlands Airport. It's the depths of winter, and time to find out whether toil, strife, and runway protective measures will pay off. An Arctic cold front is sweeping across the country, threatening severe frost and snow. 
At the moment there is a yellow weather warning uh, to the south of us and to the northeast of us. With the cargo operation, they need to have all their deliveries made on time. So it's imperative that their aircraft arrive on time. Perched 170 foot high in East Midlands control tower. Got Papa Mike 91 Kilo taxi to the RVL hangar. Pleasure. Paul Kay has the vital job of guiding cargo planes safely in. He's also under huge pressure to avoid disruption to this lucrative, time-critical trade. So he's praying that new ice sensors deliver to avoid a winter of discontent. So we put the new ice detection system in to monitor the runway surface. It senses the, the temperature of that surface. It also knows what type of solution we put on, what water content is on the runway. And so it gives us an accurate prediction tool to look at when we need to go out and de-ice the runway surface to maintain operations. We need to make sure that the whole site is ready for this cold snap tonight. One of those gearing up for the deep freeze is the fire department. During winter storms, water turns from friend to foe. The fire service do the main majority of the snow clearing. The snow vehicles we have at East Midlands Airport are a series of manned tractor units, and they are our main sort of strike force for when the weather turns bad and the snow comes. Well, it looks a mighty impressive snow fighting lineup. But as they say, practice makes perfect. Skewnine off station on the eastern, doing some snow training. So before the wintry weather strikes, the boys do a dummy runway run. OK, guys, just one more run then. Uh, just check the serviceability of the vehicles. Meanwhile, ground ops crew Keith is waiting in the wings. And it appears the good old ice predictor sensors seem good sense after all. Before the runway sensor check, uh, it was showing as a minus one temperature at 10 o'clock, and at nine o'clock it was showing as zero. Now it's showing as minus one at nine o'clock, so things can change. We'd like to say it's going to be this temperature at this time all the time. Unfortunately, Mother Nature has other ideas, so we constantly need to check and look at this. We have a plan, but this can change the plan because it's, it's live, it's telling us what it's expected to be, what it's anticipated to be. So with that early ice warning, Keith mobilises the de-icers to get ahead of the earlier than expected freeze. It's been decided that we're going to go out and anti-ice. The two rigs that we're following now with extended booms, it puts it down as a fine mist. As you can see, they go the full width of the taxiway and the runway. So it's a case of choosing the right moment so that we can get it down at the right time in the right amount. We're already ahead of the game. That night, the winter storms sweep in. Although East Midlands avoids the worst of the snow, temperatures plummet to a frigid minus six degrees Celsius. But crucially for the hectic cargo operation, life trundles on as normal. The runway's in really good shape. Uh, there is no ice patches, so all the work that we did yesterday uh, with the anti-icing and all the weather predictions that we worked on yesterday have made sure that we've had no ice on the runway and the runways remain fully operational and serviceable, which is the name of the game. It's no good having an airport if you can't land your planes. In French Guiana, the Guiana Space Centre is in a state of high alert. After three years designing, building and air freighting 5,000 miles in the gigantic Antonov transporter, the hundred-plus million dollar Hellas Sat-4 satellite is poised for liftoff. People are gearing up for the launch. The liftoff due in just under a quarter of an hour. We are go for launch. Carrying the satellite on its last leg into space orbit, 
is legendary rocket Ariane 5, the heavy launcher that really puts mmm into mega. Attention for the decompte final. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Schedule, the space rocket engages 1,340 tons of thrust and blasts towards the stars, reaching 25,000 miles per hour to break free of Earth's gravity. Once in space, it releases its telecommunications satellite to connect the Middle East and Europe. It's a fantastic feeling uh, knowing that we've accomplished such a great job to work on these satellites. It's really exciting getting to this day. Next time, there's more crazy cargo, more fabulous freighters, and more demanding deadlines to hit as Mega Air cranks it up to the max.